Thanks so much, Jill. And um, I'm delighted to welcome Andy. It's um, a real honor to have him join us today. Now, if you've ever visited Falkirk, you might have seen a majestic pair of horsehead sculptures towering over the landscape. They tower over the M9 as well, and an awful lot of people see it as they drive past in their cars. They are the Kelpies, and they are probably now one of the most iconic landmarks in Scotland. And they're actually produced by, created by, and realized by Dr. Andy Scott. Now, Andy's a renowned Scottish sculptor. He's created stunning figurative artworks that evoke emotion, imagination, and reflects the past and the culture of this country. His sculptures often depict animals and humans, and he's very interested in that relationship between them. Uh, there's also a clear affinity for horses there, which I think we'll, we'll certainly raise as we speak to him. He graduated from Glasgow School of Art in 1986. He's now one of the leading sculptures internationally, very big in the UK. He works, interestingly, with galvanized and stainless steel and cast bronze, bronze, creating monumental sculptures that blend realism and fantasy. A lot of figurative work that you're going to see some evidence of in a moment. Um, he's completed over 80 projects across the UK and overseas. And when you understand the scale of some of these projects, you'll see that's quite a workload. We're very proud that Andy's an honorary graduate of Glasgow Caledonian, and we're very grateful for his support to the university over the years. So we're thrilled to have him back with us today to have a conversation and for him to share his wisdom and his expertise and experience with us. So it's my pleasure now to invite Andy Scott to join me in conversation. Andy, welcome. Good morning. Yes, uh, very nice to see you, John, and join you all this morning from from uh, sunny Los Angeles here, where I'm currently based. And as I was just saying a wee minute ago, I need to warn you in advance that it's uh, bin collection day, so there might be a big bin truck coming past us soon. So I'll keep my fingers crossed that doesn't interrupt the flow of the chat. But uh, good morning to you all, and thanks very much for joining us. Okay, well, we're going to start with um, having a look at some of your work, because I think that's the most important thing. And we're going to yeah. invite you to talk us through the, that, Andy. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, it's, as a sculptor, it would be a, a bit of a strange conversation if we didn't have some images to let you see what it is that I actually do. As uh, John very kindly said earlier, um, the Kelpies are probably my best known pieces in Scotland and certainly have become, uh, I guess you could say, icons for the country, which is an, a pretty incredible uh, uh, feeling for me. Uh, but it, uh, it all started a long time ago. Uh, as John said a wee minute ago, I graduated from the art school in 86. And then after that, for about nearly 10 years, I spent a long time doing all sorts of different jobs. My career twisted and turned. It was by no means a case of uh, leaving the art school and then doing big outdoor sculpture. Far from it, in fact. But the first big piece that did come along was almost 10 years later, um, actually a bit long. It was 1997. I did this particular sculpture, which stands beside the M8 motorway just outside Glasgow. Some of you may have seen it. It's called the Heavy Horse. It was named by a local school kid, actually. Um, and it's right there, right beside the highway, and uh, still standing proud the last time I drove through uh, by on my way to Edinburgh. Um, the interesting thing, it really started my career as, as a professional full-time public sculptor. Up until then, as I said, I'd been doing all sorts of different things, um, a lot of interior design projects, working in museums, building props for the opera, for the ballet, TV, all sorts of different things until eventually I managed to win this commission and uh, then it really changed things around for me. Um, it led to a whole series of uh, community-based projects across central Scotland. Where that one is in Easterhouse, Shettleston, the local people really took it to heart, which was a great uh, 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 compliment for me. And they began to raise funds for their own sculptures in different parts of Glasgow and across Scotland. So a lot of them were community-based small scale pieces but very very important to engender a sense of pride in local communities um, as things developed my, my profile grew and i applied for an exhibition in australia and uh, john if you jump to the next slide please um, 
a couple of years, within a few years of doing the Heavy Horse and, and some other pieces, I uh, saw a call for entries for an exhibition in Australia, in Sydney, and um, I made yet another horse, which I have to say uh, proved to be very popular. And in fact, the, the local town there where I made it in Queensland uh, decided to buy it. Um, and I ended up setting up a studio there in Queensland, just outside Brisbane. And uh, for, a, for a few years, uh, Australia really paid a very large part of my, uh, paid a large part in, in my career. I was backwards and forwards quite a few times and I, met, I came very close to moving over there. Um, the way things worked out, that, that didn't happen. And uh, eventually common sense took over and I decided it was more sensible to keep going with the studio in Scotland at the time. Um, so this particular piece is called Arabesque, and this was on a beach, uh, Carumban in Queensland, uh, close to Brisbane. And this this one was bought by uh, Gold Coast City Council, and it's still there. Another sculpture beside a highway. I seem to have done a few of them over the years, and that's beside uh, the Gold Coast Highway in Queensland. Um, I've actually been invited back to Queensland next year. I'm going over in June uh, to speak at an event there. Uh, in the, in the town where that original first Australian sculpture is, so I'm, I'm thrilled about that. Um, but it was a fantastic experience to be able to break out from Scotland and and uh, try uh, my hand working elsewhere on the globe, and it really was fairly transformative for me. If you go back with the, the slides there, John, please, um, I'm going to jump geographically from sunny Queensland to Cumbernauld, and um, you can see, uh, maybe some of you have seen or driven past Aria, um, I'm showing these images at a kind of jumbled up timeline and, and uh, mostly because um, it kind of indicates the way my career has rolled. It was never a one, two, three career path. Uh, when you're a self-employed, I guess when you're self-employed in any job, especially as a self-employed artist, you have to take jobs as and when they come and it creates quite a haphazard and uh, a bit of a roller coaster of a career. So you'll need to forgive that these these uh, the timeline of these sculptures jump about a little bit, but um, Aria came along uh, eventually, and the reason I've included it is that until the Kelpies came along, it was the biggest freestanding sculpture in Scotland. She's about 35 feet high, sorry, just over 10 metres, in uh, right there beside the M80 in Scotland. And uh, she was built in, I think, about 13 sections and has become quite a prominent landmark for the town of Cumbernauld. It was, was a big success at the time um, and stands there very proudly. Uh, yeah, she's uh, she's become uh, quite successful, as I say. She was named after Aria Fadilla, who was the Roman emperor, uh, the Roman Antonine of the Antonine Wall. A a Aria Fadilla was her, again, local uh, schoolgirls came up with a title, which taught me a thing or two about the, the local history of the Cumbernauld area. Um, but there she is, galvanized steel and, and 10 meters tall. John, if you, if you go on, please. Um, Meanwhile, when the Kelpies were taking shape, I'd also been, uh, sorry, when Aria was taking shape, I'd got wind of a project from Scottish Canals who'd approached me and asked me if I was interested in creating a landmark sculpture for the canal. And um, I said I would, I'd be delighted to. And they already had the title of the Kelpies. And they asked me if I would take the title and, and come up with some creative sculptural notions. I think the canals really wanted to do something that would complement the uh, the famous Falkirk wheel, which had been a great success for them. And they wanted another huge, iconic uh, structure. Their idea was much more engineering based, uh, if I'm honest with you, kind of boring. And uh, I came up with a, an idea that really, I think, uh, made them stop and raise their eyebrows. and. Unfortunately, at that point, they didn't have any money. So what I did was I said I would make them a, a pair of small uh, sculptures free of charge on the condition that if they won lottery funding, they would then pay me to make a, a proper set, you know, and, and to design the, uh, the concept further. So in that particular image of me and my, my Glasgow studio there in, in Mary Hill in Glasgow, behind me, you can see the first model I made of the Kelpies. And the one I'm working on is the second model of the Kelpies, and that is the one that was eventually scaled up to become the full-scale 30-metre-high um, sculptures that you now see. So um, they, the Kelpies themselves were then, these models were then scanned, meticulously scanned, and we had to go through an incredibly complex tendering process, and then it became uh, a really a major engineering and construction project. My job shifted from being the sculptor to being a kind of... Uh, I guess you could say consultant, overseer, 
keeping an eye on the project, working with the fabrication guys, working with the council, Scottish canals, and overseeing the whole project. Uh, it was a very lengthy thing, um, but it all hinged on these models that I made in my Glasgow studio there. The models, uh, John, if you jump to the next slide, the models themselves became uh, very successful little sculptures in their own right. And um, uh, Scottish Canals, um, my colleagues at Falkirk Council decided it'd be nice to be able to use them as uh, maybe we would call them ambassadors for the real project. And we were invited to exhibit them in Bryant Park in New York City. That's them just there on 6th Avenue. And that was an incredible experience. Um, uh, uh, just a mind-blowing thing to be able to deliver them all the way to New York City. And uh, we actually had to stop the traffic on 6th Avenue and use a big crane to lift them over and drop them down onto Bryant Park. And the, the police had to stop everything and all the taxi drivers were all going crazy. It was a real New York scene. It was fantastic. Very, very exciting uh, to be part of that. They stayed in New York uh, for a few months. Uh, they were also exhibited in Chicago. And we had offers to show them in different places in America. But sadly, there was no funding available. So back they came to Scotland where they now are back residing at the site of the actual full-size Kelpies. I, I think there are plans afoot to tour them again, and hopefully they'll be traveling around the country sometime soon. But it was a fantastic thing to have them there in New York. And that was what first gave my wife and I the, the inkling that there might be a chance of uh, maybe setting up a studio over in America, which is where we are now. Uh, but a, a fantastic uh, thing to be part of. And John, if you jump to the next slide, the experience also led um, to a collaboration with Glasgow Caledonian University, for which I'm eternally grateful. And this was uh, an exhibition that we had in the New York campus um, in, uh, in Soho there, Greenwich Village. Um, and it was a fantastic experience to have a little show of small scale studies, bronzes, smaller sculptures uh, in the campus. I think if memory serves me right, just before the university got its full accreditation, as a, as a teaching institution, the space was ready. They were setting up for all the, the background stuff for the, for, the, for the campus building there. And it was such an honor to be part of uh, that little exhibition. And uh, it was a great experience. And nothing beats seeing your own sculpture hanging on a banner outside a gallery in New York City. It really was a, a real thrill. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm very grateful to GCU's uh, help with that. It was a fantastic experience. If you jump on to the next one, John. Uh, this is where things got really interesting with the Kelpies and this wonderful picture shows them under construction and it gives you perhaps some sense of just how complex they were. Um, 300 tons each, 1200 tons of foundation slabs. Um, they were fabricated by a company in Yorkshire. There were specialist steel erectors came up from Essex, I think, to put them together. Um, it was a phenomenal thing to be part of. As you can tell, you know, by this stage, as I said earlier, I was uh, uh, more what you might call hands-off, although a visited site many, many times to keep an eye on things, and it really was such a thrill to see them beginning to take shape on the on the horizon there beside the, the canal in Falkirk. Um, it took, the project took over eight years to pull together, but of those eight years, about six years was involved, sadly, with politics, uh, funding challenges, People forget now, but when these things were initiated, it was the big financial crash, 2008, 2007, 2008. So money, money became incredibly tight, but it took a real confidence and vision from the National Lottery and from the canals and Falkirk Council to stick with it and pull them together. And it really was an amazing experience. If you jump to the next side, John, um, it culminated uh, a little while after they were officially finished by a visit from the Queen, that wee lady there in the pink is uh, Queen Elizabeth. God bless her. She was an amazing lady on that day. It was just wonderful to meet her with a couple of my, my original models for the project and uh, spend some time with the, getting the official uh, royal seal as it well. That was a, a lovely a lovely day. Um, and it kind of capped off the whole experience. It was a, a wonderful way to give them, uh, kind of launch them in a sense for me and kind of ended the project for me a little bit. It let me kind of move on. If you jump to the next slide, John, um, and what's happened since, as I mentioned earlier on, is the Kelpies have become almost like um, icons or symbols for the country. Visit Scotland used them, which is fantastic. I, sadly, I don't have any of Visit, Visit Scotland's campaign uh, material for this uh, presentation, but um, you can see that the Great Britain campaign also used them. 
and uh, they've now been used as promotional icons around the world. Um, even as you can tell by the one uh, on the, the one of them was actually in uh, China, uh, advertising Scotland and Great Britain to the Chinese uh, tourism market, which was uh, fantastic. And uh, the other one there, the culture is Great Britain. That poster used to stand at Heathrow Airport. So when people were arriving into the country from anywhere around the world, the first thing they would see arriving was those two sculptures that I'd designed a few slides ago in my little workshop up in Mary Hill in Glasgow beside the canal. So a pretty amazing transformation and, and something I'm, I'm very proud of, I have to say. Um, but, you know, you can't rest on your laurels in any job, but especially not in my job. You have to keep moving on. And all the time you're hustling, looking for new work, getting your name out there. And John, if you jump to the next slide, uh, this project is one which came along after the Kelpies, a project um, for Aberdeen up in the north of Scotland. And I included this one just to let you see, I get, give you a sense of how I put things together. You saw the, the image of the Kelpies earlier. This one lets you see me actually back in the old Glasgow studio, hands-on, welded steel assembly. The next image, John, shows you the finished piece. This is a leopard, as you can tell. It stands on top of a, a 10, 10 or 11 meter high steel column inside the central atrium of a hotel and office development. And the total height is about 55 feet, uh, what's that, F uh, 15, 16 meters tall, um, I think. And uh, it's about two tons and it balances on that very, very small, uh, it's about 400, 300 millimeter diameter steel tube. And so I had to balance two tons of leopard on top of that very narrow steel column inside this big office block. It really was a fantastic thing, a very precarious balancing job. And uh, we managed to pull it off. It's galvanized steel um, and uh, it all went uh, fantastically well. I'm pleased to say, as John mentioned uh, in, the, in the introduction, I work a lot with animals and with combinations of, of humans and animals and mythology. And this one kind of exemplifies one of those uh, lines of investigation as an artist. The leopard is on the heraldic coat of arms of the city of Aberdeen. So I chose that as an image to make this sculpture. And I think a lot of people actually in Aberdeen themselves couldn't quite figure out where it had come from. But the client absolutely loved it. And it's become very uh, popular landmark up there in, in the city um, and still stands to this day looking down on people down in the atrium space in that, uh, that big office development. If we jump on to the next one, uh, Lullaby is a, a very different one. Although it continues my interest with animals, it's actually a very somber and fairly sad uh, little, uh, when I say little, it's actually about three and a half meters high by about four meters across. It's right in Princess Street Garden underneath the castle there in Edinburgh. And it was a, a very sad little memorial sculpture for uh, people who'd lost infants and babies. So a, a very sad little sculpture. I was approached by a parents group to come up with a, an emblem for their uh, sadness and bereavement. It was a very, very emotionally intense job. And, you know, with all the sculpting and experiences you have on, on building sites and engineers and all that stuff, nothing quite prepares you for the more emotional and spiritual element that can be brought by well-designed and well-placed uh, public sculpture. Uh, this little piece is called Lullaby, and it uh, is, I don't know if you can see clearly, but it's got little flowers etched onto the surface, and those flowers are forget-me-nots. It was all based on the idea that elephants never forget, and the, just the way that the, the parents would never forget their little ones that they'd lost. So, as I say, a very sad piece, one I was very, very humbled and honoured to have been part of, and it certainly added a different dimension to my practice, and uh, a very, very... Um, humbling experience to have been part of that, as I say. But we'll move on to cheerier things. In the next slide, please. Um, it was around about this time I'd started to set up the studio in America. As I mentioned earlier, my wife and I uh, thrilled by the experience of visiting, exhibiting with GCU in New York and also um, having the, uh, the display in Bryant Park. We decided to apply for green cards to come and work and live in America. We were successful. We got the green cards and we came over and set up the first studio in Philadelphia. A lot of people ask why Philly. Uh, the simple reason is that New York City was way too expensive for us. So only an hour or so away is Philadelphia. We set up a fantastic studio there where I worked for five years. This is one of the pieces which actually I started in Scotland. The frame behind me there was started in Scotland and then shipped across to Philadelphia where I finished it. And then eventually, um, if you uh, jump onto the next slide, 
Um, there's me with the finished beast. It was bought by a, a private client in New York, in uh, sorry, in Mexico. It was actually uh, at a meeting in New York at that exhibition that I had, uh, which led to this whole commission and happening. So I, I include that just to show you that, again, you never know quite where the next job's coming from. Serendipity, sliding doors, weird experiences can happen. And it's a strange way to make a living, but to go from Mary Hill to New York to Philadelphia to Mexico City was just one of the many twists and turns that my career has taken. Uh, this big minotaur is in a private collection of a big art-loving uh, millionaire guy down there in Mexico and uh, one of my own personal favourite sculptures actually. It's just a pity that it's in a private environment rather than a public realm. Um, if we jump on to the next one please. Just like the one I, I mentioned there with, um, uh, with the Minotaur, this one also started in Glasgow and then shifted over to America and then this one came back to Glasgow. It's Charles Rennie McIntosh. Hopefully some of you will recognize him. Um, it was made in clay in the Philadelphia studio and then cast in bronze by a Philly foundry and then we shipped the finished sculpture back over. I was actually commissioned while I was still living in Glasgow and then I had to tell the client that I was moving to America, but I'm pleased to say he was very laid back about it all. As long as I delivered it on time and it didn't cost him any more, um, uh, they, uh, they were happy for me to make it there. So it was commissioned by Sanctuary Housing stands outside their development in Anderson in Glasgow and is uh, a long overdue monument to Charles Rennie McIntosh. As a graduate of Glasgow School of Art, it was such a thrill to be able to capture the, the genius that is uh, that McIntosh and, and uh, give him his rightful place in Glasgow. Um, if you jump on, John, we'll, we'll quickly move along. Uh, so we've gone from Glasgow to New York to Philadelphia to Mexico and then here we are. Uh, bizarrely in Colorado, up in the Rocky Mountains in a ski resort. You never know where things are coming from and when I was working in the Philadelphia studio we had an inquiry from somebody in a little town called Breckenridge and they wanted an emblem that would symbolize their city, or sorry their town, up there in the mountains and um, without going into the full story uh, there was a very strong Nordic Scandinavian background to that town and with a little bit of investigation we found out that, that a chap called Uller is the Scandinavian, the Viking god of snow. And uh, they went, we decided we'd make this uh, statue of Uller, the snow god. And he stands there up in, in Colorado, about 12,000 feet up in the Rockies. I can tell you folks now that that was the coldest installation I've ever done. It was about minus 15. It was the start of the snow season. I was absolutely frozen to the bone, but we managed to pull it off and he still stands there. That's actually a tiny little LED light in the end of his arrow there. And he's about to fire his arrow up to the mountaintop to bring good snow for the for the ski seasons there. So um, a pretty unusual project, but um, nice to be able to spread things over to Colorado. If we move on, John. Uh, this is just a shot showing the Philadelphia studio as it was. Um, working on a private client's uh, project there. You can see me and one of my colleagues in the background just underneath the eagle's leg in the background there. Gives you some idea of the scale of things. This was for a, a private collector in New Hampshire and it just gives you a shot of the kind of uh, the general studio that I had in Philadelphia. They commissioned an eagle, a stag and a lynx from me for a private uh, property in New Hampshire. If you jump on, John, there's the lynx. Uh, there's me with my old dog. That was uh, lovely Cobus, who's sadly no longer with us. God bless him. But anyway, there we have the big lynx. It gives you some idea of the scale of it. If the next picture, John, should show you, I believe, uh, and there's the finished piece being installed. Another snowy installation in New Hampshire. Um, all three of those sculptures were galvanized, so they give that they become in uh, that nice silvery metallic finish, and they they were installed at a private uh, collection up in New Hampshire in the northeast of uh, the United States. Um, again, it continues my fascination with animals and uh, and how people interact, interact, especially with these overscale animals. It's uh, something I really enjoy working with as a subject matter. Let's jump on, John. I'm conscious of time. I want to get through these kind of quickly for you. Um, um, during lockdown, uh, or just before COVID actually happened, we had an inquiry from Manchester City Football Club uh, down in England. And um, I'm very pleased to say that uh, they commissioned me to do a statue of one of their 
club captains, one of the greatest players, a chap called Vincent Company, who had just uh, left the club uh, for, the, for the Etihad Stadium there. And uh, they liked my idea so much. Not only did, did they commission this statue, they then commissioned uh, one of David Silva, another great player, and then another one of Sergio Aguero. And um, again, it kind of summarizes uh, the, the, the roller coaster and the weirds, uh, the way that luck can, can play a part in a career, any career, but especially mine, because that job happened just as lockdown began to kick in for the COVID, the whole COVID thing, which seems like a lifetime ago, but it wasn't so long. And that job really saved our bacon through the whole COVID thing because we had no other work happening. And the studio, you know, all the studios had to close. No commissions were happening. But this one, I'm pleased to say, managed to sneak in under the wire. And we built such a good relationship with Manchester City that, as I say, it led to three commissions. And it kept us solid, working busy all the way through the COVID experience. So it was a real lifesaver, uh, if you pardon the pun. Uh, to keep us going all the way through that. So there he stands outside the Etihad. He's about uh, four and a half metres tall. So what's that, 12, 13 feet, something like that, uh, on top of a one metre plinth. So he's a fairly imposing character, as he was, is in real life. And uh, yeah, a lovely one. To, they were a great, great bunch to work for, a fantastic client and a, a very successful project. Now, if COVID hadn't happened, uh, Hannick and I would have moved from Philadelphia a bit earlier, but with the, with the lockdown and all that, nobody could move anywhere. So we stayed in Philly for another two years, but we'd, we'd always had plans to move to Los Angeles. We'd visited LA, we'd really enjoyed it. And then we had an, off, an exhibition uh, opportunity. If, if you jump to the next slide, John, we'd had the offer of an exhibition at the UK Consul General's residence in Hancock Park, which is a, a very swanky part of Los Angeles. And we'd sent across this sculpture here that you see. This one was originally made, bizarrely, to be shown on George Street in Edinburgh um, for a project with Hamilton and Inches Silversmiths. And I made it. We exhibited it there on George Street. It went down very well, but, you know, it wasn't really for sale. So I was left with this big sculpture in, in Glasgow thinking, what am I going to do with it? We moved to America. I didn't want to leave it behind. So I shipped it over to Philly. And then we were offered this show in Los Angeles, so we moved it. So it had gone from Edinburgh, Glasgow, Philadelphia, and all the way across to Los Angeles. Um, it was only supposed to be there for a couple of months, but they, I'm very pleased to say that the Consul General's office there here in Los Angeles liked it so much they decided to keep it. It's still there and uh, has become a, a kind of much-loved little landmark for the area and a very uh, welcome symbol for the Consul General's residence. They host all sorts of... Oscar parties and all the fantastic things to do with the UK, Scottish uh, business in, in, in America. In fact, there's a function tonight there. Sadly, I can't go, but uh, there'll be another red carpet affair there tonight. And I've been to a few wonderful parties there, and it's just such a, a head rush, an absolute thrill to be able to stand beside my big sculpture there just before the Oscars and all the celebs are coming in and getting the pictures taken in front of my sculpture. And I'm just this wee guy from Maryhill in Glasgow standing there with the biggest smile you ever saw. It's just been a fantastic experience. We now have a studio here in LA, not far from home, and I'm working on a couple of exciting projects. I can't show you any images of them, unfortunately, because I have to sign non-disclosure agreements. Um, but the studio is nice and busy. We're chasing a few more. We've still got inquiries, one coming from Scotland, a couple of others from around the place. So uh, things look pretty good for the future, but we're very happy here in Los Angeles now. Heading back to Scotland soon, I'm pleased to say. We try and get back once or twice a year. And um, yeah, there you go. So there's a very quick gallop through my uh, portfolio. There's literally thousands of images of dozens of projects, but hopefully that gave you some idea of a cross-section of uh, some of my work and how it all came uh, came together. So I think the idea now is that we'll we'll have a wee bit of a chat, maybe do some questions and answers, and, and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. So thanks for looking at my wee slideshow, and, and let's move on. Thank you so much. That was so nice to have so, an artist talking through their work. I mean, you, you said a few times Mary Hill there, and I suppose I want to take you back for the, the students amongst us. How do you get from being, uh, you know, uh, a, a lad growing up in Mary Hill to being a figurative sculpture on a scale rarely seen and working out of L.A.? Tell us about that journey, you know. Ooh, uh, I, I wish I could give you a simple answer as like uh, this happened and then that happened. And, but it, it really has been a roller. It's not until you finally arrive here, you think back and think, well, 
you know, how did we end up with this? It was hard work. That's the one thing I would say. Um, the dedication. Uh, it's not easy doing what I do. It's not easy anyway, but it's especially difficult in, in difficult financial times, which everywhere in the world has been going through and seems to continue. Um, I guess I just took opportunities when I saw them, the whole Australia thing. You know, I applied for the exhibition, got in, and then developed a whole new series of work over there. Uh, just persevere, you know. Sometimes, not so much these days, but in the past, sometimes I would go for three, four months with no inquiries. It took a, a very steely nerve, if you, again, if you pardon the pun, <laughs> it takes a steely nerve to stick with it. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say I did. It's all about introductions. It's all about people you meet and reputation. We don't really advertise. Being an artist, it's, it's not really about advertising in a traditional sense or even marketing doesn't really work. It's about reputation. It's about connections, networks. Uh, you know, I might work with an architect who then meets an engineer who suggests to a developer, the developer then, you know, it all kind of snowballs and spreads out. It's a, it's a very complex and, and intricate web, but somehow and amongst it all, you, you make a living. So there's no easy answer, John. It just, uh, one thing mm. rolls to the next and doors open, other doors close. You take opportunities when you can. And here we are now in, in Los Angeles. And listen, I'll be honest, there's, you know, we're sitting here, it's by no means a guaranteed, you know, for all I know, the jobs I think I've got might fall through and something else might come along. It's it's a very peculiar way to make a living and it doesn't follow any common, I'm sure all your business studies students there at GCU will be shaking their head with their heads in their hands thinking, what is this guy doing? But somehow we've made it work, you know. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a bit of a roller coaster, but here we are. I think there's a lesson there about flexibility. There's a lesson there about tenacity, possibly. Um, I think, I suppose, you know, it's just such an unusual pathway for many. And, um, you know, art was always a big part of your your upbringing and your education. Um, and I guess you've just followed a primary love and it, you were lucky enough for that to become your your job, I guess. Yeah. You know, it's that. And not many people achieve that. You know, a lot of people are stuck in a, a job that they don't really enjoy for the majority of their life. So it's it's, yeah. it's great when the two coincide. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that, yeah. Um, I have to – there's one slight – I sometimes, uh, you know, it's a job, you know. I, I think people can over-romanticize and imagine me sitting in my studio, scratching my chin, you know, pondering the world. And it, it's, it's, it's hard work. It really is. I, I don't see it the way other people see it. I bring in several tons of steel and I work physically work very hard and bash it and shape it and chop it and weld it and it becomes something else. And meanwhile, behind the scenes, I'm also dealing, well, I have to say these days, my, my, my wife, is Hanika, is, who's an architect, is also the manager of the business. She's dealing with planning departments and accountants and lawyers and contracts. And it's, it's very much a job rather than just a hobby or a passion. Uh, although I'm pleased to say that these days I tend to mostly get projects that I actually want to do mostly. Um, and that makes a big difference. But yeah, it's, um, I'm, I've been very lucky that I was able to follow a career path based on something that I, I did have a passion for from the art school. Um, even that though, you know, leaving college, I had no idea where I was going to end up. I, 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 one quick anecdote, I was offered a commission. A chap bought a little piece of sculpture that I made at my degree show back in 86. And a wee while afterwards, he offered me an exhibition, uh, sorry, a, a commission. Um, he has a very successful business just outside Glasgow and he wanted a sculpture for outside it, uh, outside his factory. And uh, in the end, I had to say I couldn't do it because I didn't know how to. And after all those years of studying at the art school, they hadn't taught me how to do public work. They hadn't taught me. I just didn't know what to do. So it was a, a real letdown for myself. And uh, he must have thought I was a nutcase. I'm pleased to say I did get in touch with him several years later and said, OK, I'm ready now. And he very politely said, well, I can't afford you now. So that was the end of that. <laughs> but um, it's um, it was an interesting thing to be able to eventually dedicate my skills to something that I love doing and make a living out of it. And those first few years out of art school, I have to say, I probably learned more than the time at art school. Because what I learned was on building sites and in working on all these different disciplines, learning real things from the electricians and the bricklayers and the steel workers on site as I designed interiors and built staircases. And it wasn't what I wanted to be doing, 
but it made a living. It kept me alive, and I learned a lot about the real world and how it how it works in Glasgow and Scotland and eventually beyond. And those lessons have stuck with me. You know, it's uh, that was very very important. Um, okay, okay. So I want to just let's let's get back to the Kelpies for a second and talk a little bit about how they've become an icon. Because if you if you kind of ask most people in the street to identify, you know, some contemporary sculpture, they'll probably come up with the Kelpies and your name and possibly the Angel of the North and, and a chap you probably never have heard of called Anthony Gormley, uh, who's, who's also responsible for quite a bit of uh, public art too. Now, there are others. I mean, I, I know Sandy Stoddart, who's, you know, uh, another figurative guy who did a lot of work in Scotland. But... Why did the Kelpies become so significant? Is it simply, as some people said to me, well, it's just scale. People notice big stuff. And I'm like, not too sure about that because there's a lot of big stuff you walk past. But yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, it's all purely, this is all purely from my, my point of view, obviously. I mean, you mentioned big stuff. Uh, I had to fight quite vociferously at one point to make sure that the Kelpies stayed the size that they now are. At one point, when I mentioned earlier, they went through some serious uh, financial challenges. And at one point, there was the discussion of making them only a third of the size that they now are, or perhaps only doing one and making it half the size. And, and there was all sorts of, I hope you can hear me above the background noise there. But uh, um, So I had to fight vociferously to, to make sure that they stayed that scale. For me, scale wasn't to do with being bigger than the Angel of the North or being the same size as this or that or the next thing. It was That was the last thought in my mind. I, I, don't, I don't have the ego to... It wasn't about size is, is important or, the, the, you know, they've got to be this big. When I stood on site there and I looked at the Oakal Hills in the distance and the, M, the M9 motorway beside them and... It's a, they're on, essentially, I think you might call it a floodplain there on the banks of the Carron and the Fourth Estuary. And they had to have a certain gravitas and scale to work. Otherwise, I felt, well, what's the point? You know, you, you need to do these things big. And bear in mind that they were also intended as a partner or as a companion for the Falkirk Wheel. And the Falkirk Wheel is a, a very large-scale engineering triumph. And if we did them as just a, a, you know, maybe 30 feet high or something, it'd be like, yeah, whatever, oh, very nice and they would pass off into, into history. But scale was, was important because of the landscape setting. It's big sky country, you know. They mm. had to have an impact, and they do. You know, they, they've worked very, very well for that. So I get it. You know, if some people wanted to pass them off as just being, you know, big is beautiful, that's fine. That's up to them. That's their opinion. But it wasn't really about that. It was, it was to do with the setting. The, I wanted to make a big statement. It was about modern Scotland. It was about Falkirk, Grangemouth, the industrial heritage of the area. My own passion for the for, for central Scotland, for where I come from, as much as anything else. I mean, people forget now, but Glasgow, across central Scotland, we built the biggest moving objects on the planet Earth. The ships that came out of the Clyde they were built just down the road from where you guys are right now, you know. And I wanted to try and fire up that passion and evoke that history of, of monumental achievement and engineering and pride and uh place and and uh yeah that's why i pushed to keep them at the size they're at and um yeah they, they seem to do their job reasonably well i'm pleased to say and you're quite relaxed about them being an icon that's used in marketing and advertising scotland not least by the national tourism organization yeah. and the visit britain as well yeah. um and that your your work is being used and your work is actually driving visitors. They're driving, yeah. you know, folk to the Helix Park where they're located. Yeah. If you haven't visited it, it is a fantastic location with obviously the Kelpies, but lots of other interesting stuff too. Yeah. And it's been responsible for a fair amount of regeneration, that site and that visitation. Let's let's just talk about that a little bit yeah. because, you know, it's not often that sculpture – and sculptural installation has that kind of effect, both as a no, brand, no. as an icon, yeah. but also as a regeneration. Absolutely, um, and, and I, I, I welcome it. 
I said a way, way back, it now must be going on for 18 years ago or something when I wrote the first, maybe even longer, when I wrote the first uh, little report or suggestion, brief if you like, for the Kelpies. And I said that if we do these things correctly, they've got the potential to become a global symbol for Scotland. And I think most people, my colleagues at Scottish Canals, I know you know some of them, must have thought I was a crackpot, you know, they're like, what the, what's he talking about, you know? But they have done, you know, and, and it shows the power of well-engineered and well-designed and well-implemented most importantly, well-sighted uh, public sculpture. And you mentioned the Helix Park there. The Helix is an incredible achievement, you know. People now take it for granted. And that, that was industrial wasteland before. It was, you know, ne completely neglected. And now when you go through there, it's just fantastic. When we lived, you know, we used to love going over, and I couldn't believe it. My father was from Falkirk. We used to go and visit my granny when I was a wee boy. And it, it wasn't a cheery place, you know. And now, as people, you know, it's absolutely transformed thanks to the Helix. And I think maybe a little bit uh, due to the, the success of the Kelpies. I like to think that anyway. Um, but you, you mentioned uh, them being used by marketing and tourism. I have no problem with that. You know, I, I'm absolutely thrilled. Um, one of the most important things for me is that my work is approachable and it's not, uh, I don't want to use the word elitist because, you know, art should be challenging, and I'm, you know, I'm delighted that there is some artwork there that, out there which you might call difficult or, you know, engages a certain cerebral uh, involvement. But I also don't like elitism in art. I think that art should be available for everybody, and I'm pleased that my work does seem to be accessible to most people. You know, people sometimes you can you can whiz past a sculpture at you know seventy miles an hour and say, "Oh, nice horse." But then when you think, well, well, why that type of horse? And why is it pointing that way? And why is this happening? And why did he put it there particularly? You know, and there's more to it than just immediately meets the eye. But at least you get it when you're going at 70 miles an hour, rather than looking at some baffling object that leaves you cold and wondering what they wasted money on. You know, I, I'm being perhaps a bit too populist in my, in my approach there, but um, it's uh, a very rich and varied topic to be involved in, that's for sure. And... Uh, when, when people like Visit Scotland and the Great Britain campaign decide to use your artwork, it would be extremely churlish to, to say no or, or you know, get bent, bent out of shape about it. The Visit Scotland, they did a fantastic little film which uh, we show often, and it, it really, it's, it's a real honour. I can't tell you, you know, to go from drawing little sketches and then seeing these things become used by a nation, it's a, a, it's a head rush, it really is. It's an incredible experience. Amazing. Okay. No, I think I think um, just from a from a tourist adv advice and tourist guidance, then definitely students should go and have a look at this site, which is all free, and you can uh, you can spend a day easily there. There's a lot of activities, and it is a transformation. And the other thing is, it's the civic pride angle, I suppose. Yeah. And I, I, as you know, I'm. I'm interested in this, but there's been very low levels of vandalism, very low levels of graffiti, uh, the, the, and the security on the site is not great, but it's quite clear that there's a fair amount of pride and, and ownership there. So, so your, your intimation of public art seems to have worked then. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're right. Um, again, it depends on what the art is and where you put it and how you go about it. Uh, if you make the work accessible, if people can understand the work that you've presented or at least engage with it somehow, I absolutely believe they're much less likely to uh, take some spray paint to it or do, do anything else crazy. Listen, there's no legislating for lunatics. There's always some crackpots out there that are going to have a, have a go at things. You just, you know, it's just part of life, unfortunately. But we've had uh, next to no examples of vandalism on any of our sculptures, not just the Kelpies. There's been mm -hmm. a couple of accidents, you know, mishaps have happened, completely unpredictable uh, things have happened in the past. But in terms of actual vandalism, next to nothing, you know, nothing serious that's caused the client to get back to me and say, this has happened, you know, it's, it's and I, I can only put that down to being respectful of the intended audience for the artwork and putting something there that's often come from either taxpayers' money or a developer's hard-earned money yeah. You have to be respectful of that that income, you know, or that uh, the funding source, and do something that is worthy of it. And that's something we've always held very close, and 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 I think it's 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 served its purpose. Um, 
In terms of the pride, just a wee, uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, I did an interview online and it was all about the economic value of public art. And the BBC had just released figures on the anniversary of the Kelpies about the investment in the local area and how much money they think they brought to the area, such and such, which is all fantastic. But the thing that you can quantify and put a sum on is this, the passion and the sense of pride and, and the, 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 the love of the area that, that good artwork can have. And can you imagine mm. if we now said, well, I tell you what, we'll give you the money back and we'll take the Kelpies away. You know, I, I, you know it's, they, they become little kids now in Falkirk. Those little kids now have been born and are growing up now in the Falkirk and Grangemouth area. And the Kelpies have always been there for them. They've always been part of their landscape and they always will be. It's, it gets into a whole metaphysical zone, which is uh, kind of hard to get your head around. You know, it's not just about uh, the dollars and pounds. So it's about something bigger than that. And it's something I'm very passionate about. That if it's done correctly, it can really transform lives. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a few questions from people who are in the chat and people who've pre-submitted them. I'm gonna go to Murray first. Murray came up with a, a one that will take you back. When you were at Glasgow School of Art and you're starting out your career, what other materials did you use, and why did steel? stand out and why is it so significant good question. So oh, yeah. to do? good question yeah at the art school when i was there the in sculpture department when you were in first year they they give you workshops and a whole series of different materials and different you know painting graphics cera excuse me ceramics whatever and sculpture and when i did it in first year i thought this is the thing for me uh, you know just the physicality of working with materials to to make artwork it i don't know somehow it seemed to suit me physically, spiritually, I just got into sculpture. I applied for that department, was accepted, and then we started, we did some stone carving and wood carving, and we did clay work, which was then cast. Uh, we, I couldn't afford bronze, so it was cast cement, and I quite enjoyed that. But then we had a very good uh, metalwork technician, I remember him very well, a chap called George Duff, kind of took me under his wing, taught me how to weld, and showed me the basics of metalworking. And I don't know, to be honest with you, John, maybe it was something to do with the, the, the history of the Clyde and the shipbuilding that I mentioned before, the heavy industries, that, that, that Clyde built thing just struck a chord with me and, and, and just, I just loved it, you know. And I have to say my first steel sculptures were kind of abstract, Anthony Carroll, it was, it was all about process and material and it took me a little while to overcome that. Um, my degree show was more to do with uh, cast figurative pieces, um, but the metalworking thing was there. And it just f fires me up. I just, I just love working with steel. It's difficult. The thing is, it's, it's hard to do. And the challenge is something I really enjoy. You know, you take lengths of steel plate or flat bar and somehow you transform it into what looks like a living, breathing creature or, or, or human or whatever. And you can tell stories with it and create these, these landmarks. And, and all of this from chopping up flat, hard steel, very unyielding. And yet somehow you can magic it into these compositions is something I'm very proud of and, and I work hard to achieve. I don't know if that's a good good answer to the question, but that's uh, pretty much what drives me on. And every job's different. So even, you know, you mentioned before, I'm, I'm well known for doing horses. Yeah. You might think a horse is a horse, you know, whatever. But each horse has its own different anatomical characteristics and, and pe especially people who know horses. If you get it wrong, you're in trouble, you know. So it's a real challenge. Each job pushes me and and I, I, I never sit back and rest on my laurels. I've always got to keep challenging myself, whether it's the pose or the breed of the horse or the, the human or whatever it is we're doing. Um, it's it's not easy, but that's what drives me on. It's a challenge. That that horse thing keeps coming up, your interest in the equine. Um, yeah. Now obviously, you do other animals too, as we saw, and you do other stuff. But the, the horse is a theme, and they are different horses. But it was great to see the one... In, in Australia there, to think yeah. that it's the other side of the world uh, and is equally appreciated and still standing. But I think, you know, a lot of the students have asked questions about this, you know, why horses, why the equine, why has that particularly um, motivated you? Yeah, uh, well, it came from that big heavy horse that I showed you that's out at Easter yeah. House. Some of, some of you might have seen it. And it really just uh, fired something in me. Um, I think one of the key things, if I'm honest, is that, that it's such a recurring theme in the history of art. There's so many great art artists all the way back to the cave paintings in France where there was horses on the walls and 
Um, and when you're when you're doing a subject like a horse, you know you're up against it with the big boys. You know there's a there's a few very very prominent benchmarks that you're competing with, and even today there's some great contemporary equine sculptors. There's an, I don't know. I don't own. I certainly don't own a horse. <laughs> I've only been on a horse twice, so there's not any great. You know they're my muse rather than than that kind of. Uh, you know, I didn't grow up with them as a child or anything. On, on my mother's side of the family, there was relatives in the dim and distant past in the docks of Anderson who, um, my, my, my mum's granddad Bobby was a drayman and he had a Clydesdale horse, so there's some lovely pictures of him with his old horse down there back in the, in the 1920s and 30s. But somehow they just, they just that fascination for me that I can't quite shake off. And even now, just now, there's a uh, one in the studio taking shape, another Clydesdale. I just love working on them. They seem to strike a chord with the audience. I think that's an important thing, if I'm honest. As a business, I've got to make a living. You know, I don't do them for me. They're too big to keep in the garden. So I've got to sell these things. I've got to turn it into money. I hate to sound so mercenary, but, you know. Um, so there is a thing where they do seem to evoke a, a good response. I think there's something about the relationship between mankind and, and horses that's very primal and deep and, and it seems to trigger something in people, especially the eyes, the, the way that people look at the sculptures and I try and bring them to life. As I say, that thing about working with a hard, uh, unyielding material and, and bringing some sense of character or energy to it is something that the, that the horse just seems to does it, does it for me, you know. I, I don't ponder it too much. I just get into it and enjoy it and challenge myself and and I hope the next one comes along. Um, yeah, I, that's not a very good answer, I'm afraid, but that's the best I can come up with. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a, I mean, Christine Hauser asked that question, one of our graduates, and there's a couple of other students keen on the, the horse angle. Here's a good one, uh, and I'm interested how you respond to this. This is um, from Kirsten Leslie. How do you feel when people put a traffic cone on top of the Macintosh statue at Anderson, just like the Duke of Wellington statue at the yeah, Gallery of Modern Art? Yeah, to be honest with you, I, I, I don't want to sound like an old curmudgeonly old grumpy geezer here, but I think that joke's done. I think, uh, you know, the Duke of Wellington, fair enough, you know, he wasn't such a nice chap and history will testify and tell stories about him. But Macintosh, to be honest with you, I thought it was cheap. I just thought it was tacky. Mm -hmm. They burnt down his art school and then you're sticking a cone on top of his head. I just, I didn't, I, I'm sure it wasn't intended to be malicious. I yeah. don't even know it. I, I'm not sure it was done genuinely. I think some people might have done it just to take a selfie, you know, and, and take an Instagram picture. And I, I don't, I have my doubts about his motivations. I'm pleased to say the client down there was very vigilant and took it off fairly quickly. I think it's such a cheesy joke now. I, I think, to be honest with you, the whole thing, as a, maybe it's because I'm a sculptor and I'm too close to the art form, but I, I just think it's a bit tacky, to be honest with you. I think it's kind of embarrassing that a city's known for a for mm. a you know, vandalising an artwork. I, I just think it's disrespectful. But that's me. Loads of people seem to think it's funny, so that's fine. But it's not my thing. As for Macintosh, as I say, I, I felt a little bit pissed, a little bit miffed about it. Um, but um, I, you know, no harm was done, and I'm sure no harm was intended. It's in the public realm, so you kind of let them go on with it. And, you know, it's, it's no big deal. But, you know, I, I just didn't think it was particularly appropriate. And the man deserved better than that, you know. Um, mm. and maybe I'm too close to him. After spending all those times looking at him and sculpting him, I felt spiritually connected, connected to him. So I was like, oh, man, give the guy a break. You just burnt his art school down, you know. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, twice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, no, I, 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 you know, as long as there's no harm done to the artwork, uh, you just let it go. You know, it's, it's fine. Yeah, I'm thinking. I think Donald Dewar uh, gets a bit of uh, a bit of hassle as well at the. Yeah, his glasses. I know the sculptor who did that, Kenny Kenny McKay, is a fantastic yeah. sculptor, very very gifted chap, and I know the I know him well and I used to know him well. Anyway, um, and yeah, the they've bent and deformed those glasses so badly so many times again it's just it's just disrespectful you know i i, I really don't get it um it's sad in a way it's kind of pathetic but that's it what can you do you know mm. I, there's an interesting question here from mark langton a graduate what's the project you would most like to complete in the future and haven't ha yet had the opportunity to undertake and why would such a project be important to you 
my immediate and kind of uh, jokey response to that is an avenue of heroes outside Hamden Park in Glasgow, but uh, I'm not sure the SFA could pay, come up with the money to pay for that one. Um, uh, the real answer is, th you know, I'm actually having discussions just now with a, a potential agent who's, who's keen to represent us, and that's actually quite a, a challenging thing to answer because I've never really had the luxury of being able to dream up projects that I personally want to do. And it was only at this stage now in my career where I'm beginning to think along those lines. I always respond to clients. I always make things for other people. They pay the wages, they keep the whole business going, they keep us alive. And I'm always, uh, the artistic challenge is to meet their aspirations, figure out why they want a sculpture, what are they trying to say. And then I interpret that and bring myself into the equation. But to dream up a sculpture purely self-motivated is an entirely different thing for me. It's, I've not had that luxury in my career. I would argue that I've also been uh, gainfully employed for my whole career. So it's not a, I'm not crying about that. It's, it's mm. certainly brought its benefits. But it is a fantastic question. I, I would love to do, there's a couple of designs um, which never saw the light of day, which again are equine based or horse, horse based themes. And um, I have a couple of projects which are based on mythological themes, uh, which are in sketchbooks and I've done little tiny, little tiny models of little maquettes and, and they're bubbling under the surface. And if I could, if I could bring them to reality, it would be fantastic. The challenge, though, is is what people forget is that even keeping a studio going costs thousands of dollars a month just, just for it to be there. And then you've got to add on all your utilities, power, insurance, all the other stuff that goes with it. So that's a big overhead to cover every month. And I need to somehow pay the bill. So it's a very difficult thing to even give yourself the time to develop personal projects when you have such a cumbersome overhead. It's a sad reality of, of sculpture painters. And I don't want to get into an argument between painting and sculpture, but painters have kind of got it easy because they don't need all that space and machinery and, and all that stuff to do their art. You know, I do, unfortunately. So it's uh, maybe if we win the lottery or something, some of those projects might come to reality. It's a great question, but I can't really give it a good answer other than a few buried projects I'd love to rekindle and, and bring bring to fruition uh, sometime in the future. But if anybody from the SFA is uh, watching this morning, you know where to find me if you want something for Hamden Park. <laughs> Okay, there's a, there's a question that's a bit like that from one of our, our members of staff, one of our colleagues, Jill and I, uh, and John, um, Julie Duncan, is asked for the strangest request for a piece of work you've been asked to produce, the most ch strangest or most challenging. They, that might be two, two different answers, but start with strange because that will get the audience interested. Strangest? Oh, my goodness, that's, that's difficult. Um... That is a, such a hard question to answer. There's been a, there's been a couple of weird little private commissions. You know, they've been they've been very uh, very flattering when people get in touch on Facebook, social media, whatever, and and they ask you, would you make a such and such for my for my granny or or you know some lovely very personal personal things. I did once make a hamster for some <laughs> for an engineer for a, a good old friend actually who's still in Glasgow, uh, an engineer colleague of mine, and uh, I made a hamster for him. <laughs> but that was a little bit of fun, you know, about this big. It took about three days or something. But anyway, um, I can't really, you know, there's been a few unusual personal things that people have asked, but and I always take them as a compliment, you know, and because it's very endearing that they've even found me in order to ask. Um, so yeah, so the strangest, uh, the, the most difficult. They they are all difficult. I think the kelpies probably without a doubt is is was the most challenging because of the scale, the engineering, the budget, funding, all that kind of stuff. That was really hard work. Um, I, I can be honest with you guys. I nearly walked away from that about six times. It was it was so hard. It it caused me real real mental problems. It was very very difficult. And uh, 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 it's only recently I've stopped twitching when I when I see them in the press. You know, it's like, it was very very difficult project to do. So they would probably be the ones I would say were the hardest. The Manchester City project was difficult too. Making a portrait likeness of somebody in steel was much harder mm -hmm. than I thought. Clay is hard enough sculpting somebody traditionally, but doing it in welded steel that that was really technically very very difficult. Um, 
artistically, I should say. Um, sorry, not a very good answer, but um, most people, I think because of my portfolio, most people, when they get in touch, they ask for fairly straightforward, you know, commissions. Um, I don't get too many weird and wonderful requests. Uh, none that spring to mind anyway. Okay. Um, I th there's a couple of questions here on books, so I'm going to try and pull them together. Um, um, Christine Watkins is asking, are you writing a book in your spare time? Uh, I'll add in brackets after that. I'd love to read about how sculptures are designed, fabricated, and finally constructed on site. Um, so uh, you, there might be a reference you give her that's, that's not your work, but I suppose it's the akin question is, is there a book or books that you've read that you found really inspirational around about sculpture and creativity? That's, uh, uh, so the answer to the first part is uh, there was a book. We did have a book out, a book about the Kelpies, the making of the Kelpies. And we we sold out two editions, mm -hmm. but then sadly the publishers went bust in uh, in Glasgow. There they they went out of business, and uh, we have since moved country and all that sort of stuff. Well, I know that Hanukkah is talking to some publishers just now about possibly, hopefully, re re uh, publishing and, and finding a uh, doing a new edition of the book. Um, books are not what you think, you know. Every, they, they don't sell as well as, as people think they will. It, it, it can be a bit of a, a vanity project for some people, and we, we learned the hard way. Um, I think now that 10 years have passed and the Kelpies have become such a part of the landscape, I think they would be, it would be a more viable proposition now uh, in terms of getting the book relaunched. Mm. But it's, it's very, very hard work, and it does take, you know, you joke about it in my spare time. It takes up a lot of time pulling it together and managing it and dealing with the publishers. Distribution is very difficult. Once you start talking to the big bookstores, it's it's almost impossible to get your book on the shelves. You know, it really is very difficult. Um, as far as books about sculpture, one that springs to mind is The Monuments Men, which was a story about the, the American and British guys during the Second World War who saved all the, uh, the sculptures and artworks in Europe that were about to be destroyed during the war. That's a fantastic read. It was made into a movie. That, that's very good. I've got a couple of books uh, just now about um, uh, Michelangelo and the, and the marble, uh, you know, more to do with the quarrying and the, and the background. There's a fantastic book about the, the, the four horses in Venice. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, you know, I don't... I, right now I'm reading a bit about Rome, ancient Rome. I don't read so many books about sculpture itself. You know, it's it's kind of business for me. I, pre I prefer to read stuff about something different. You know, it's a bit of a, a busman's holiday, really, if, if that's the right phrase to use. Um, I want to switch switch off from sculpture but rather than keep reading about it. I think it's probably the best explanation. I, suppose, I, mean, I, I was just going to say, finally, one thing I would add is I have literally dozens, probably hundreds, of uh, reference source material on other sculptors, museums, you know, exhibitions and things. So we're surrounded by books about sculpture, but they're more as a, a reference source rather than a good sit-down, you know, bedtime read sort of thing, that's for sure. Okay, there's, there's an interesting question about, kind of about the future. Is, I suppose what the question she's trying to tease out, uh, this is Sibisi Timbalatu. Um, so she's really saying, does sculpture, the kind of formal figurative stuff you do, have a future, given the, the technological age we're in now? Or is art moving in different directions? We can see that with other artists who are taking up new forms. Will Do you think it'll still remain? Um, do you think there's, there's still a place for it? It yeah, looks to me like, you know, I go down to Trafalgar Square and I look at what's what's moving there and I look at stuff popping up and I go to places like Yorkshire Sculpture Park, which has grown amazingly over the years as a, as a yeah. great site of a whole variety of the form. Uh, that's a, just a fantastic place to visit, a really family-friendly. Yep. But, you know, from your side, is, is there a future for this art form, well, then, I suppose? All I can, all I can say is we're, we're, the workshop's busy and we're, getting, we're still getting inquiries, so I certainly hope so. I, ironically, despite the incredible advances of technology, which is happening at a lightning speed these days, I actually believe that there, there always will, and, and I think, actually, it may become more um more needed and more appreciated 
in an age of technology that handmade objects uh, are, are respected and revered and sought after. I hope I'm right in saying that. Um, I, I should probably point out that when I'm making those sculptures, I don't use any computer programs. I make them all by hand. I very rarely make, make small models. You know, I, I'll do a couple of, I, I would, in an ideal world, I'd do a couple of sketches and then go straight into the full-size sculpture. These days, clients demand visualizations and, you know, very slick CGI fly-throughs and all that stuff. We work with a guy who does that for us, and, and he's very, very skilled. But that's not my thing at all. I like to just make sculpture. It's, it's, what, it's what I'm here for. And um, I'm pleased to say there still does seem to be a market and a demand for that. And I think, uh, I think that's going to continue. I really do. I think the evidence of pieces that I've done, like memorial sculpture, you saw an example before, where people have a very strong emotional and spiritual connection to an artwork that's been made by hand by an individual. It is a, it is a very profound experience, especially if you're lucky enough to, to be the artist who's made that piece. My old friend Kenny Hunter did a fantastic little fireman sculpture outside Central Station. Very, very well-respected piece. Uh, that one springs to mind, my own children's memorial, other, other pieces that I've done. I still believe that there is a place for artists who make things in the public realm, and, and I'm pleased to say in the private, private collections too. So it's a great question, but it certainly doesn't seem to be affecting us just now in any way other than the demand from clients to have super slick visualizations. It's, technology seems to have eroded people's imagination, we find. I used to be able to say to people, here's a sketch of whatever it might be, look at my portfolio, use your imagination, this is what I'm going to build you. And they would get it. Nowadays, you have to jump through so many hoops and spend fortunes, and I mean thousands and thousands of dollars, pounds, on, 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 um, on visualizations and things for a job you might not even get. You know, it's... It's a very, very, uh, it can be, sometimes can be a, a bit of a soul-destroying part of the process. Um, short answer is yes. I hope so, because otherwise I'll be out of a job. <laughs> I'm, I'm, that's, that's a good question for us to round up. But just back to Christine Watkins, because she was asking in the chat there for the actual name of that book. I think you said it was called The Making of the Kelpies. Yeah, it's just, it's just called The Kelpies. Might you might get it on Amazon, Christine, if you look around. Yeah, you might do, it, Christine, but be careful knows. because another friend of mine tried to get one and it was a crazy price, you know, somebody obviously had taken So just be careful. Uh, I'm sure you'll find a, maybe, maybe a used copy somewhere. Um, but we're, we're very hopeful that we'll find a publisher that wants to bring out or, or revisit the book in, over the next year or so. And hopefully we'll, we'll certainly bring it through. As for me writing another type of book, I have no, I barely got time to walk the dog, so that's never going to happen. <laughs> okay. Listen, you don't have to write a book. Your, your uh, commentary today was legion for, for many of us. So thank you so much. And we will record this so students can download it and others can download it in the future. It'll go into our archive um, and it'll be there as a, a kind of testament. So thank you very much for taking us through the walkthrough of your work early on, which was absolutely fantastic. And I think if you if you are coming back to Glasgow, please save time for a lunch or a breakfast. We'd be delighted to to host you uh, and just yeah, talk yeah. a little bit about GCU and 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 what absolutely. we do and the students, etc. We can, yeah, you know, we will only take a couple of hours of your time, but it'd be great to do that. Um, Andy, absolutely, and, I'll uh, take you up on that. We'll, we'll be back over before yeah. the end of the year. I'll be in touch. Yeah, yeah for and sure. And please bring your wife. We'd be we'd be delighted to do that. Um, yeah, listen, I've got to, I've got to say one last thing, John. If it wasn't for Hanukkah, I wouldn't know what day of the week it was. She's the brains in the outfit, <laughs> you know. So yeah. as Gillian well knows, she's the boss. So <laughs> absolutely, yeah. no, we'll, I'll definitely be in touch about that for sure. No, that'll be fantastic. All right. This, you have a fantastic weekend when it comes. Thank you Thank so you much, much for doing that. Um, Finally, th thanks everybody for listening. I, I hope it all made sense. Thank you very, very much for your time this morning. It was a pleasure to talk to you all. Cheers. Thanks, Andy. Bye thanks for now. Bye -bye. Bye Cheers. Now. Thank you.